This week, we reach the vestibule of hell. <laughs> now, I'm not talking about a wedding. <clears throat> I'm talking about Dante's Canto 3. Now, before we get into the good stuff, uh, I think we should pause just a moment to talk about the concept of hell that we're running into. I mean, yeah, I know, I know. We all understand the idea of an eternity of flame, pitchforks, and Yoko Ono singing. But I think we need to unpack the Christian theology into this one to better understand some of the subtle carryings on of Dante's uh, work. The idea of hell has evolved over the centuries, moving from the Old Testament concept of a shadowy afterlife with no comforts uh, uh, to the lake of fire that we find in the New Testament, uh, and then on to the particular tortures divided by medieval sadists. Now, as we jump into this, uh, we are going to see that Dante's a little choked up uh, and shocked at first when he sees uh, these things. He's even sympathetic at times for the plight of the damned. Uh, but this changes over the course of the, of the Inferno. Why? Well, as some of the texts will tell us, uh, it's because hell is shown as the place where divine justice is taking place. Virgil takes a lot of pains to emphasize the idea that the people are, are in hell for a reason. It, it's, and, and really, in this theology, because of a deliberate choice. Now, what that means is the idea that Christian theology promotes the idea that, that God's giving divine grace uh, to everyone, uh, and uh, it's available to anyone who chooses to receive it. Uh, but uh, if you reject that grace, well, then you've chosen to reject that grace, and thus you have chosen hell. So in that respect, Christian theology promotes the idea that by that choice, you deserve hell. Uh, and so no one should feel sorry for you. Now, modern critiques of the idea of hell complain that finite crimes don't really deserve an infinite punishment, and uh, that's a viable point to make. Uh, but in the end, uh, we have to understand where Dante was coming from uh, and his worldview to understand this particular work. So Dante was all about uh, the eternity of this damnation. Uh, hell is where the penalty fits the crime, that divine retribution is taking place, and thus we have the ingredients for the many stops along the way that we'll see. Uh, a sort of uh, Kerouac meets Cormac McCarthy meets Stephen King type thing in some places. So, since it's not the focal point here, we're going to have to leave off debates about Kant's idea that we have somehow accepted the idea of justice, so we have to take the consequences no matter how bad they are, versus Quanvig's complaint that corrupted people, fallen people, can't really make an informed choice uh, about what they need to do and what they can't do. In any event, we're not going to debate that kind of thing, uh, as valid as some of those uh, statements may be. So, <laughs> it's time to abandon hope. <laughs> I am the way into the city of woe. I am the way to a forsaken people. I am the way into eternal sorrow. Sacred justice moved my architect. I was raised here by divine omnipotence, primordial love, and ultimate intellect. Only those elements time cannot wear were made before me, and beyond time I stand. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. These mysteries I read cut into stone above a gate, and turning I said, Master... What is the meaning of this harsh inscription? Yeah, what does it mean? And it's important to understand this, because here's where Dante's defining all of this. The sign promotes the idea that, that God himself is the architect of hell. It is an eternal place, uh, with only three other elements being older. Uh, and as you dig deeper, that really refers to the angels, the Empyrean, or heaven, uh, and the first matter, which is kind of like the primary elements for the cosmos uh, in medieval science. So these are the elements that, that cannot wear as, as he talks about this. So the gates of hell, <laughs> ironically, predate humanity. Now, one might pause at the idea that God created hell before the fall, but, you know, remember, the angels rebelled before creation, uh, so that was originally their uh, destiny. Uh, but, according to this opening, God, in his omnipotence, knew what would happen and designed the place to be appropriately just for even fallen humanity that he knew was going to fall after his creation. So, any of it. The mention of love seems out of place here, but again, 
The idea is that love establishes justice. Uh, a sort of divine, uh, this hurts me more than it hurts you type idea. <laughs> Needless to say, hope dies in the doorway. <laughs> sort of like a Taco Bell. <laughs> we should cut that. No, we should cut that. And he then, as initiate to novice, Here must you put by all division of spirit and gather your soul against all cowardice. This is the place I told you to expect. Here you shall pass among the fallen people, souls who have lost the good of intellect. Virgil really here is just saying, hey, buck up, don't be a coward. So saying, he put forth his hand to me, and with a gentle, encouraging smile, he led me through the gate of mystery. Here, sighs and cries and wails coiled and recoiled on the starless air, spilling my soul to tears, a confusion of tongues and monstrous accents toiled in pain and anger. Voices harsh and shrill and sounds of blows, all intermingled, raised tumult and pandemonium that still whirls on the air forever dirty with it, as if a whirlwind sucked at sand. And I, holding my head in horror, cried, Sweet spirit, what souls are these who run through this black haze? And he said to me, these are the nearly soulless, whose lies concluded neither blame nor praise. Now, who are these people? These are what some have called uh, the opportunists. Uh, they're really people who committed neither to good nor evil in life, just going along with the flow uh, to what fits best for them. They passively live their lives without making any conscious choices, bowing to the winds of opportunity to get by. A sort of Susan Collins, if you will. But uh, these indecisive people are rejected by both heaven and hell. These are not in any neutral place because in the end, Dante must be drawing from Aristotle who said that if one faces a choice between good and evil, to not choose at all really boils down to evil. They are mixed here with that despicable core, angels who neither for God nor Satan, but only for themselves. The high creator scourged them from heaven for its perfect beauty, and hell will not receive them since the wicked might feel some glory over them. Whoa, whoa, whoa. let me jump in here uh, a second here, because there's an interesting little side uh, note here. The neutral angels is an interesting idea. Now, some were like, we don't know where this idea comes from and stuff. Yeah, but I think we got some clues. Now, a reminder, Satan and the demons are fallen angels who rebelled against God in eternity past. Here, there's a mention of neutral angels. Now, there does not seem to be any biblical verse that alludes to such a creature. Uh, but we do find some interesting tidbits in medieval folklore. For example, The Voyage of St. Brendan. It's an Irish tale uh, that may have originated as early as the 900s. And then there's a Dutch translation of it somewhere in the 1200s. Now, Abbot Brendan is basically on a voyage to see heaven uh, and go to the Blessed Isles, as they, they spoke about. Uh, and in the process, like kind of like an, uh, a Christian Odysseus, he lands on several places, several islands, and one of them he lands on has several white birds who, in the course of the, the story, tell him that they are the neutral angels who can see heaven but can only praise God from afar. Now, Another interesting obscure reference in medieval uh, literature uh, is uh, a, a kind of a, a world chronic. In, in the German, it's the Weltchronik by Johns Einickel, who, as the title suggests, gives a poetic history of the world. This work dates somewhere around 1272, uh, and it tells about the creation, the fall. Uh, but in the midst of it, he does mention uh, those who did not choose a side uh, and thus were condemned by both sides. Uh, and so I, I, I see some of this, and, and I think, hmm, Dante must be drawing upon some of this. And again, this seems to be a part of classic Celtic and Northern European folklore, uh, and Dante seems to have latched onto it in this particular case. I, I don't see where else he could have gotten it, but probably some better scholars on literature and Dante might be able to tell me. And I, Master, what gnaws at them so hideously? Their lamentation stuns the very air. They have no hope of death, he answered me. And in their blind and unattaining state, their miserable lives have sunk so low that they must envy every other fate. No word of them survives their living season. Mercy and justice deny them even a name. Let us not speak of them. Look, 
and pass on. I saw a banner there upon the mist, circling and circling. It seemed to scorn all paws, so it ran on, and still behind it pressed a never-ending rout of souls in pain. I had not thought death had undone so many as passed before me in that mournful train. Now, Virgil tells Dante, ignore these people. Again, they deserve it. The banner they chase, which normally represents a cause, uh, which these people are condemned to chase and never catch, uh, is going to move for all eternity. And some I knew among them. Last of all, I recognized the shadow of that soul who in his cowardice made the great denial. <laughs> now, here, Dante drops in our first historical dig at somebody. Now, he recognizes one of the shades as the one who made possible the great denial. Now, who is this? Well, this is a reference to Pope Celestine V. He was a pope uh, that abdicated the papacy in pursuit of uh, a retired saintly life because he feared the sinful world. Uh, now, the stories are is the fact that one of his assistants basically encouraged him in this and then scared him into the fact that, you know, you're going to sin and it could be bad and you're the Pope and that could be even worse. So you probably should just get out of the way. And the guy did so. And that's kind of the, 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 the gossip behind this, all right? Because then what does he do? He takes over as Pope, and he's going to become uh, Boniface VIII. Now, supposedly there was a series of secret votes and intrigues, and he got the post. Now, Dante hates Boniface, and we're going to see later on where Dante thinks that Pope is going to spend eternity. Here's a hint. It's pretty deep in hell. So, in any event, in this case, Dante believes that Celestine's cowardice opened the door to a lot of nonsense within the papacy that took place subsequently. Uh, and, uh, again, a lot of horrible events that subsequently took place because of him stepping down. At once I understood for certain these were of that retrograde and faithless crew hateful to God and to his enemies. These wretches, never born and never dead, ran naked in a swarm of wasps and hornets that, that goaded them the more, the more they fled, and made their faces stream with bloody gouts of pus and tears that dribbled to their feet to be swallowed there by loathsome worms and maggots. So, these moral cowards were forced to run forever, stung by wasps and hornets. The blood and the pus uh, from their wounds and their tears mingled down, continually dripping to the ground where worms and maggots feed on them. No, I'm not. Now I'm going to make that reference again. Then looking onward, I made out a throng assembled on the beach of a wide river. Whereupon I turned to him, Master, I long to know what souls there are, and what strange usage makes them as eager to cross as they seem to be in this infected light. At which the sage, all this shall be made known to you when we stand on the joyless beach of Acheron. And I cast down my eyes, sensing a reprimand in what he said. And so walked I aside in silence and ashamed until we came through the dead cavern to that sunless tide. Next, Dante finds himself being drawn to a mob of people lying in the banks of the river Acheron, straight out of that classical background that we talked about way at the beginning. Uh, the Greeks spoke of this river as one of the rivers of Hades, uh, or the afterlife. Virgil mentions it in the sixth book of the Aeneid. So again, that merger of Christian theology and classical writings. There, steering towards us in an ancient ferry, came an old man with a white bush of hair, bellowing, Woe to you depraved souls! Bury here and forever all hope of paradise! I come to lead you to the other shore, into eternal dark, into fire and ice. And you who are living yet, I say, be gone from those who are dead. But when he saw me stand against his violence, he began again, By other windings and by other steerage shall you cross to that other shore. Not here, not here. A lighter craft than mine must give you passage. Also from classical mythology is the boatman of Hades, Charon. Now, one was supposed to pay him a coin to, to gain passage across the river, but here they're compelled by other reasons, as we shall see. Uh, but when he sees Dante, he throws a fit. He tells Dante to get lost because he's alive and doesn't belong here. Plus, he alludes to the other windings, which refers to the guarded passage into purgatory and heaven. And my guide to him, Sharon, bite back your spleen. This has been willed where what is willed must be, and is not yours to ask what it may mean. But Virgil tells him, back off, this passage has been willed by higher forces. 
the steersman of that march of ruined souls, who wore a wheel of flame around each eye, stifled the rage that shook his woolly jaws. But those unmanned and naked spirits there turned pale with fear, and their teeth began to chatter at sound of his crude bellow. In despair, they blasphemed God, their parents, their time on earth, the race of Adam, and the day and the hour, and the place and the seed and the womb that gave them birth. But all together they drew to that grim shore where all must come who lose the fear of God. Weeping and cursing they come forevermore. And demon Sharon with his eyes like burning coals herds them in, and with a whistling oar flails on the stragglers to his wake of souls. As leaves in autumn loosen and stream down until the branch stands bare above its tatters, spread on the rustling ground, so one by one the evil seed of Adam in its fall cast themselves at his signal from the shore and streamed away like birds who hear their call. So they are gone over that shadowy water. And always before they reach the other shore, a new noise stirs on this, and new throngs gather. My son, the courteous master said to me, all who die in the shadow of God's wrath converge to this from every clime and country, and all pass over eagerly, for here divine justice transforms and spurs them so their dread turns wish. They yearn for what they fear. No soul in grace comes ever to this crossing. Therefore, if Sharon rages at your presence, you will understand the reason for his cursing. Now, in Dante's version, uh, Sharon is, is transformed into a demon instead of an old man. And the dead are not just looking to cross to peaceful fields as in the Greek world, but eagerly pressing forward for passage into hell. Note the blasphemy and cursing that's taking place. These people are not meant to be pitied, but seen as people beyond redemption and deserve to be here. Virgil comments here that they're compelled to cross because, as in life, they rejected God, eagerly seeking their sin, and thus, in damnation, they eagerly seek hell, which is mirrored in this uh, passage. When he had spoken, all the twilight country shook so violently, the terror of it bathes me with sweat, even in memory. The tear-soaked ground gave out a sigh of wind that spewed itself in flame on a red sky, and all my shattered senses left me. Blind, like one whom sleep comes over in a swoon, I stumbled into darkness and went down. Dante's swoon. This really seemed to be a poetic device to do two things. First, uh, to get us to see that Dante is overwhelmed by the horrors he sees. And, and second, to make the transition into hell more smooth instead of having to narrate the passage and the crossing and the transition there. Uh, he is, after all, a living being going to the place of the dead. So Dante saves an explanation of how that's possible by having him faint and then wake up in the first circle of hell. But we'll talk about the geography of hell uh, next month. Anyway, so uh, there we go. Did you take out the Taco Bell reference? Yeah, because, you know, the CEO is probably a demon. <laughs>